Gordon, and I'm one of the, uh, the meditators who uh, help in, in the production of the courses here and, and the uh, organization of the, uh, the meditation center. It's a rather auspicious occasion, in a way, because almost one year ago to the day was our first course at this meditation center. As, as many of you know, and, and as uh, our neighbors uh, in this area know, that uh, we, we began this about uh, one year ago, and we are very happy with the, uh, the results that we've had so far. Uh, Mr. Guanca, Mr. S.M. Guanca and his wife, Mrs. Guanca, have, have come to join us on this occasion. This is their first visit to the center. Uh, Mr. Guanca is a, uh, a teacher of Vipassana meditation in the tradition of his teacher, Sayaji Uba Ken of Burma. Mr. Guanca is the director of the Vipassana International Academy in uh, Igatpura, India. And in the last roughly 20 years or so, Than 18 other meditation centers throughout the world organized like this one. There's uh, one in uh, three in the United States, four in the United States now, uh, one in, in Europe, two in Europe, I guess, and uh, Australia, a number in India, Japan, and other places around the world. At this time, also, there are approximately 20,000 students per year taking meditation courses in this tradition. Mr. Goenka has come to, uh, to visit the center for the first time, and he's going to address us tonight on uh, the Vipassana meditation, the art of living, which is basically a little outline about what, what this technique is all about and, and what it does and how it helps people in their daily life. here this evening <laughs> on this quiet land of the Pashana, on this beautiful bright day of Indian tropical sun. Those of you who have not undergone a course of uh, the Pashana, would certainly like to know what is Vipassana, how to practice it, and why to practice it, and why to have a center like this. In short, Vipassana is a process of self-realization, truth realization, Realization of the truth pertaining to oneself, within oneself, by oneself, at the experiential level. All the sages and saints of the past from different countries have advised us, know thyself, know thyself. But we misunderstood. We tried to know ourselves merely at the intellectual level. That does not work. Or we tried to know ourselves at the devotional level. We have great devotion in the words of the enlightened persons, saintly persons, and we just accept it. That also does not work. What they meant was, know thyself at the experiential level. And this knowing yourself at the experiential level will make such a big change in your life, change for better. And Vipassana is the process of realizing the truth about oneself, within oneself, at the experiential level. 
It is a pure science of mind and matter. The whole physical structure, which one keeps on saying, I, I, mine, mine, identifying oneself with this physical structure, and developing tremendous amount of attachment towards this physical structure, and as a result of which, one keeps on becoming unbalanced, agitated, miserable. And this psychic structure, the mental structure, what is this mental structure? One keeps on saying this as I, my, I, my. Identification with this mental structure and tremendous amount of attachment towards this mental structure. Again, this results in tension in losing the balance of the mind brings a lot of misery. Let us understand what is this physical structure, what is this mental structure, and how one is constantly influencing the other. How one keeps on getting influenced by the other constantly, every moment. How an interaction is going on between these two, there are currents going deep inside this framework of the body, cross currents, under currents. And because one remains ignorant of what is happening inside, one does not know that one is becoming a slave, a prisoner of one's own habit pattern, the habit pattern of blind reaction. And that habit pattern makes one so miserable. How to break that habit? Merely understanding the reality at the intellectual level by listening to such discourses or reading books does not help. One has to go to the depth, depth of one's own mind and matter and see how the interaction is going on. How wrongly one keeps on reacting, reacting either with craving or clinging or reacting with aversion and hatred losing the balance of the mind, losing the equilibrium of the mind, the equanimity of the mind, the equipoise of the mind, and start feeling miserable. At the apparent level, one remains under the impression that I feel miserable because of something which has happened outside. Somebody has insulted me. Somebody has said some abusing words to me. Or somebody has done something which I don't like, which goes against my interest. Something which has happened outside has made me miserable. Yes. At the apparent level it is true. This is also a truth. But a truth just on the surface level. The enlightened person went deep inside and found out where is the real cause of misery. This is the apparent cause of misery. And this kind of misery, you can't come out of it. Because if you keep on giving importance to the cause of misery outside, then you use all your efforts, your energy, your strength to rectify things outside. This is not possible. You may be successful in correcting one person to change his or her behavior according to your liking, but where is the guarantee that someone else will not raise his or her head and start doing something which you don't like? No solution. If you go deep inside, then it becomes so clear that the real cause lies, lies inside and there is a way to eradicate this cause inside. Happy in every situation. All the ups and downs of the life, all the vicissitudes of the life. You can't change the world, but you can change the world within yourself. You can change yourself because the difficulty is with each individual inside. 
to explore the truth about oneself, that means about this physical structure, about this mental structure, the constant reaction, interaction going on. First, one has to get an atmosphere quite congenial with least disturbances, outside disturbances, where one can train the mind to see things inside, to experience things inside. The habit pattern of the mind is that it always gives importance to things outside from the time when a state at birth, opened eyes, started seeing outside, outside, outside. One never cared to see things inside, which is much more important. This was my thing. Even if somebody sits for a meditation, there are many types of meditation. One sits for a meditation, closed eyes, but not observing the truth inside. One starts verbalizing something to concentrate on it. One starts visualizing something, imagining something contemplating something, this is just the intellectual game, your own creation. You have to observe the reality as it is, not as you would like it to be. And the question of it help you to observe the reality as it is. One has never tried this kind of, even if one has tried meditation, one has not tried this kind of meditation. So it requires an atmosphere where you can train your mind to observe things inside, the reality inside. It is a difficult process, difficult process in the sense that you have to change the habit pattern of the mind which is, which has become so strong from so many periods, so many years of the past. So a minimum 10 days, 10 days minimum required to learn this how to observe the reality inside, how to understand where the misery arises, how to understand to eradicate this cause of misery and come out of misery, to purify the mind, purify the mind from all the defilements, defilements of anger, hatred, ill will, animosity, ego, passion, fear, insecurity, worry, all those, these impurities makes one very agitated, very unhappy. How to eradicate them? The whole process of Vipassana is for that purpose. As one goes deep inside, it becomes clearer and clearer that the nature does not want us to generate any defilement in the mind. When some pollution is created in the atmosphere outside, the chemical pollution, gaseous pollution, the whole atmosphere becomes so unhealthy. Nature does not like it. But a constant pollution is going on within the framework of this body. Every moment, the peace of the mind is harmed. One keeps on generating either anger or hatred or ill will or animosity or passion or fear, something or the other which pollutes the atmosphere inside, nature does not like it. Nature starts punishing us. As one starts observing the reality inside, it becomes clearer and clearer at the experiential level that as and when I generate any pollution in my mind, any defilement, anger or hatred or ill will or animosity, anything, the nature starts punishing me. Or if you want to say the God Almighty, the God Almighty starts punishing me. Then and there. Not that you have to wait till the end of your life and after that you will be punished in this way or that way. Nothing to it. Now, here and now, if you observe inside, you will find you become so agitated. Whenever you generate any negativity in the mind, you are the first victim of your negativity. You generate anger and shout on somebody, insult somebody, abuse somebody, that other person may get agitated or even may not get agitated. If this person is a good Vipassana meditator, may not get agitated. But even if one gets agitated, it is much later. First you started harming yourself. 
is law of nature? Universal law of nature. Whoever may generate negativity in the mind, the nature starts punishing. When we keep on calling oneself a Christian, or a Muslim, or a Hindu, or a Buddhist, or a Jain, or a Sikh, or a Jew, it makes no difference. When we call oneself an American or a Russian or a Chinese or a Japanese or Indian, it makes no difference. When we be black or white or brown or yellow, it makes no difference. Man or a woman, it makes no difference. Law of nature is such, and this is universal law of nature. The moment one generates negativity in the mind, the nature starts to punish. And if you have any technique, any method, by you to take out this negativity, mind is free from negativity. That means the mind is pure. You will notice when the mind is pure. By nature, this pure mind is full of infinite love. Infinite love. A love which is so pure, which does not expect anything in return. A love which does not have a trace of passion, full of compassion infinite compassion, infinite joy, sympathetic joy, infinite equanimity. These are the basic characteristics of a pure mind. And whenever one attains this stage of pure mind, the nature starts rewarding then and there. Of course, you get something after the death also, but don't give much importance to that. What you gain now, now, here and now, you start gaining all the rewards from the, from the nature. When your mind is pure, full of these good qualities, love, compassion, goodwill, and you know how to observe reality inside, you will feel you are enjoying so much of peace, so much of peace, so much of harmony. So this is the reward from the nature, or you may call it the reward from the God Almighty. The reward is there. That shows that there are certain universal law, laws of natures. And if one understands these laws and starts living a life in line with the law, one remains very happy, very harmonious, very joyful, always lives a good life for oneself and helps others to live a good, good life. If one keeps on breaking this law, one starts suffering, harms oneself, harms others. Whenever I generate negativity, I become this rebel, that is law of nature. But then, big ignorance, when I generate negativity and become very miserable, I start distributing this misery to others. I make the entire atmosphere around me so tense. Whenever I generate anger, I will make the entire atmosphere around me so tense. Anyone comes in contact with me at that time, becomes tense, becomes miserable. Then one starts understanding, this is not the proper way of life. When you keep on harming yourself, you keep on suffering from your own negativities, and you harm others. You remain unhappy, you make others unhappy. This is not the proper way of life. If you learn a technique by which you can generate nothing but peace and harmony within yourself. You live a very peaceful life, a harmonious life, which is good for you. And you feel the entire atmosphere around you full of love, compassion, goodwill, peace, harmony. You help others to live a good life of peace and harmony. This is a good way of life. This is what Vipassana teaches, an art of living, how to live peacefully and harmoniously within and how to generate nothing but peace and harmony for others. What Buddhism about it? What Hinduism about it? What Christianity about it? What cult about it? What dogma about it? This is just law of nature. Anyone goes inside can understand this law of nature, the truth is truth, universal truth for everybody. Therefore, Vipassana does not require somebody to be converted from one organized religion to another organized religion. Nothing to it. The melody, the misery is universal. When someone generates anger, what lives
label are you going to put on that? Hindu anger, Christian anger, Buddhist anger, or American anger, or Russian anger, what anger? Anger is anger. And the misery that you suffer because of that anger, what label will you do? Hindu misery, Christian misery, Jewish misery, 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 universal melody. And if you do an art to take out that negativity, and you start enjoying peace and harmony within, what labor? Is it Hindu peace? Hindu harmony? Or Christian peace, Christian harmony? Nothing doing. It's universal. Law of nature. Somebody becomes enlightened by exploring the truth within his inside and then understanding the universal law of nature. The world is round like a ball, rotates on its axis. Believe you found out. And it declares it is so. Some believe, some didn't believe. After some time, all started believing. Was anybody converted to a particular religion? Nothing doing. This is the truth. Whether one agrees or not agrees, this is the truth. The law of gravity. Some Newton found out the law of gravity. People started accepting. converted from one religion to another religion. Some Einstein finds out the law of relativity. We start accepting it. What religion about it? What sect about it? What dogma about it? Similarly, an enlightened person goes inside and finds out the interaction of mind and matter and how out of ignorance, without understanding, we keep on reacting with these defilement because those specific if we stop reacting with these defilements, we come out of the misery. So simple. Law of nature. When people start understanding it and they start accepting it and they start living a life without this misery, it is not to convert oneself from one organized religion to another organized religion. Therefore, Vipassana has nothing to do with these organized religions. If one is a Christian, one may continue to remain Christian throughout the life, continue to call oneself a Christian. A Hindu, a Hindu, a Muslim, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a Buddhist, a Jain, a Jain, a Jewish, a Jewish. But live a good life. Be a good human being. Learn the art of living. How to live a good life. If one does not live a good life, how can one be a good Christian? How can one be a good Muslim, a good Buddhist, a good, good Indian, a good American? And Vipassana teaches us how to be a good human being good human being is free from the negativities which harm oneself and harm others. A good human being is one who generates love, compassion, goodwill, which is so peaceful for, for oneself and gives nothing but peace and harmony for others. Therefore, the whole process, the understanding of Vipassana is non-sectarian. The practice of Vipassana, non-sectarian. Because it is just law of nature, understanding the universal law of nature and trying to learn a life which is in line with the law of nature. Such centers are necessary. Because unless you have the atmosphere which is free from external disturbances, you can't learn the technique of going deep inside. If all the time there are disturbances, outside disturbances, your mind is already accustomed to remain with the external objects. And if you have so much of external objects which keep on disturbing you, it will be so difficult to learn a technique to observe the truth inside. Therefore, such centers, and certainly when somebody is taught here, then the center is closed for outside people to come. You are cut off from the outside world. No newspapers. No television, no radio, no letters, no correspondence, no telephone. It's like a prison. But it is a very healthy prison. Just to learn the art. Just to learn the art for ten days and then you live life. You make use of this for a daily life. And people come to hospital. If I am unhealthy, I go to hospital. Not to live in the hospital for the whole life. I gain my health there and make use of that health in my day-to-day -day life. Similarly, 
you go to a school, you go to a college, you learn. You learn something and make use of that learning in your day-to-day -day life. Similarly, this is an institute where you learn a particular technique which will be helpful to you throughout the life. Today, it looks something new. But I'm sure within the last 10 years or so, so many centers are coming up around the world because people have started appreciating that this is not like any other meditation, this is not like any other cult or dogma or belief, this is pure science, pure science of mind and matter and something beyond mind and matter, exploring the entire field of mind and matter, one transcends the field of mind and matter and experiences something beyond that, maybe for a few minutes, few hours, and then when one comes out of that, one is a totally changed person, totally changed person. So the whole process is a process of purification of the mind, taking it out from the old habit pattern of reacting with craving, with aversion, and making oneself unbalanced and making oneself miserable, harming others, harming oneself. Ten days does not make you perfect in the channel, but ten days gives you a rough outline and you now know how to observe the reality within yourself. And the whole technique is such that it can be practiced by anyone because the technique is universal. If you have not yet come to a course and you come decide for 10 days, all right, I give 10 days of my life, let me see what these people are doing. Let me see what this technique is. You will be asked to sit down, sit down comfortably in any posture that keeps you comfortable for longer periods, closed eyes, closed mouth. You have to explore the reality with, about yourself within the framework of the body, at the physical level, at the mental level. What is happening? At the physical level, there is no activity going on. You are not doing anything. You are sitting calm, quiet, not doing anything. At the vocal level, closed mouth, you are not saying anything, no vocal action. Now, what is happening? The first reality that you will experience is a flow of breath, constant flow of breath, the breath coming in, the breath going out, natural, you are doing nothing. Without any effort, the breath comes in, without any effort, the breath goes out. This is the reality pertaining to your physical structure, just start with this. Keep your attention at the entrance of the nostrils. And just keep keep on observing objectively the breath coming in, going out, coming in, natural breath. You are not supposed to make it a breathing exercise. You are not supposed to make it a control of the breath, disciplining of the breath. Let it be natural. If it is deep, you are just aware it is deep. If it is shallow, you are just aware it is shallow. If it passes through the left nostril, you are aware left nostril, right nostril, right nostril. You don't try to change the flow the natural flow of respiration. In one day, two days, in three days, observing the respiration, respiration, the mind becomes more and more calm, quiet, becomes subtler and subtler, becomes more sensitive. Then it starts experiencing subtler realities pertaining to this physical structure. One starts experiencing some sensation or the other. Some biochemical reaction, some electromagnetic reaction is taking place every moment in every little particle of the body. But because you are keeping your attention just at the entrance, you start feeling this sensation on this area. And you are asked to observe it. The fourth day, the fifth day, you find that the entire body, everywhere from the top of the head to the tips of the toes, everywhere there is some sensation or the other, every moment. And you are asked to observe it. Just observe, do nothing. That things happen as they happen. And you observe observe objectively without identifying yourself with the sensation, without liking a particular sensation and without disliking a particular sensation, mere observation, mere observation. Initially, it looks very absurd. <coughs> but I have started doing, observing the breath. Well, even if I don't observe the breath, it was there. What I gained by observing the breath? I am not observing this heat or cold or perspiration or throbbing or pulsing or vibrating or tingling. What I gained by this? But very soon one starts understanding the breath as well as the sensations on the body are not merely 
related to the body, not merely related to the matter, they are strongly related to the mind and very strongly related to the mental pollution, the mental defilement, the mental impurities. As you are observing your breath, your mind starts wandering in the past or the future, you start remembering something and maybe you start generating anger, hatred. And you will notice that whenever you generate any negativity in the mind, the breath loses its normality. It is no more normal. It will become slightly high, hard, fast. And when that negativity has gone away, again it becomes normal. Oh, so breath is very strongly related to your mind, very strongly related to your mental defilements and impurities. Similarly, these sensations on the body, when you get anger or hatred or passion or fear, some sensation or the other starts arising. You generate anger and you find a lot of heat there, perspiration, pulsation, tension. All those are the result of your anger. This is the enlightenment of an enlightened person. The enlightened person goes inside like a research scientist to, science, to find out why we are miserable. Where lies the real cause of our misery and how we can come out of this misery. And this is what he does, going deep inside, exploring the truth, exploring the truth as it is, as it is. It becomes so clear. Something has happened outside. And you have immediately, if you are a good meditator, you will notice immediately some sensation has started on your body. A word, some words have come in contact with your ears. Some shape, form, color, etc. has come in contact with your eyes. A smell has come in contact with your nose. Some taste has come in contact with your tongue. Something tangible has come in contact on the body. Or some thought has come in contact with the mind. These are the six sense doors. And when the respective object comes in contact, immediately there is a sensation on the body. If you like that particular object, there is a pleasant sensation on the body. If you don't like it, there is an unpleasant sensation on the body. And whenever you experience a pleasant sensation on the body, the behavior pattern of the mind is such that you start reacting with craving, clinging. Oh, I want more. This is wonderful. I want more. I want more. And you become tense. You lose the balance of your mind. Whenever something unpleasant happens outside, and because of that you feel an unpleasant sensation inside, you start reacting with aversion, hatred, aversion, hatred. And you find again you lost the balance of your mind. You become very miserable. This technique makes you understand that at the experiential level, what is going on deep inside. At a very deep level, you will notice that whenever you generate any defilement, say you generated anger, you will notice that immediately there is a secretion of some biochemicals which starts flowing with the stream of the blood. The secretion may be glandular or non-glandular, it starts flowing with the blood. And this particular biochemical is so unpleasant. When you, when that starts flowing, you feel so unpleasant that you can react. You react with anger. You have generated anger and you have started experiencing an unpleasant sensation in the body. And this unpleasant sensation on the body and you are again started reacting with anger. Your anger generates this unpleasant sensation. This unpleasant sensation generates more anger. A vicious circle has started. And for hours together, you keep on rolling in anger. Similarly, passion. Hours together, you keep on rolling in passion. Fear. Hours together, you keep on rolling in fear. Every time you keep on rolling in any of the impurity, you're miserable. There must be a process to come out of it. And Vipassana helps you. Whatever chemical has started flowing, it gives a sensation on the body. And if you learn how to observe, you just observe it without reacting to it. Let me see how long it lasts. And you find that it becomes weaker and weaker, feebler and feebler, and the related impurity becomes feebler and feebler and passes away. <coughs> you started changing the habit pattern of your mind. The whole process is for that purpose, to change the behavior pattern of the mind at the deepest level, at the so-called unconscious level, at the root level, so that instead of reacting with negativities and making yourself miserable, making others miserable, you can maintain the calmness, the tranquility, the purity, the peace, the heart.
harmony within yourself and live a happy life, good life and generate nothing but peace and harmony for others. Those of you who have not experienced it are welcome. Come and give a trial. This is pure science. Don't get frightened that any foreign cult will be imposed on you or foreign dogma or belief will be imposed on you. It's a pure science of interaction between mind and matter, a pure science to understand the real cause of our misery, a pure science to eradicate the cause of misery and start living a better life and enjoy peace and harmony within. May all of you who have attended this evening, this talk of Vipassana, may all of you find time to experience this peace and harmony within. May all of you enjoy real happiness. Real happiness. Real happiness. <coughs> if anyone has any questions uh, of Mr. Bukalanka, he would be very happy to, uh, to receive those questions and answer them. About the technique, about the courses, about the meditation center, or, or anything that, uh, that you'd like to address to us. Questions? Are they so clear? Very clear. <laughs> uh, a good uh, explanation of everything there. We're delighted that you came uh, to visit us this evening. We, uh, uh, as you all know, we have regular courses that uh, occur each month for a period of 10 days. Uh, there's a schedule that will be here around uh, the outside or in the dining hall inside, uh, and there's also some small brochures and other information that tell you about Vipassana and about the courses and, and a little bit about the schedule and how things go on every day uh, during the course, the, the, the schedule of your meditation. Uh, you will also find probably some application blanks if any of you would, uh, would like to, uh, to sign up uh, for any of our future courses. But, uh, there is one uh, every month uh, of the period of 10 days. We, uh, we will have some refreshments here that we invite you to join some cooking and a few other things, I think, that will be just on the outside here. And uh, we invite you to stay around and visit. And if you didn't get a chance to see the entirety of the meditation center when you first came, uh, please feel free to walk around and, and take a look at the, at the entire facility. This is, this is where the courses are, are conducted each, uh, each month. Again, thank you for coming. Uh, we appreciate it. Please feel welcome to come back to see us at any time. And there'll be some refreshments out here in this area whenever you're uh, in just a few minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Thomas Chrisman, and I'd like to welcome you all here this afternoon on behalf of the Southwest Vipassana Association. We're very pleased to have with us Mr. and Mrs. S. N. Goanka. Mr. Goanka is the director of the Vipassana International Academy in, Dham in Igatpuri, India. He's a renowned teacher of Vipassana meditation in the tradition of his teacher, Sayaji Uba Kin of Burma. Mr. Guanka is here to inaugurate the Southwest Vipassana Meditation Center, which was established about one year ago 
outside of a small town near here, near Kaufman, Texas, about uh, 45 minutes from Dallas. This center is one of 18 that exist around the world now for the teaching of Vipassana meditation in this tradition. The meditation is taught in 10-day residential courses where the students attend and stay for the 10 days to study this technique. Mr. Goenka will speak to us this afternoon on Vipassana meditation, an art of living. assembled here this afternoon to understand what is Vipassana and how does it help us in our day-to-day -day life. It is known as Vipassana meditation, but the word meditation carries different meanings to different <clears throat> Generally, by meditation, one understands a technique which helps you to concentrate your mind, to keep your mind free from chattering. Yes, Vipassana also helps you to concentrate your mind, make it free from chattering, but it goes much beyond that. This is not the final aim of Vipassana. The practice of Vipassana purifies the mind. It liberates the mind from all the negativities like anger, hatred, ill will, animosity, passion, fear, ego, etc. Concentration is an aid, but the aim is purification of the mind. When you work with a technique, which helps you to concentrate the mind, mostly. You use the object of concentration, a word, a syllable, a mantra, and mentally you keep on reciting it. You keep on reciting it and you find your mind is getting concentrated. By mental verbalization, you try to concentrate your mind. Or you have an imaginary vision, a shape, a form of someone in whom you have great devotion, deep devotion. You keep on visualizing this shape, this form, this face, again and again, repeatedly at the mental level and you find your mind is getting concentrated. Or you start contemplating, have good thoughts, positive thoughts, and keep on repeating those thoughts mentally, and you find your mind getting concentrated. Vipassana is totally different from all this. No verbalization is permitted, no visualization is permitted. No imagination is permitted. No contemplation. No suggestions, auto-suggestions, auto-suggestions. Nothing of this. 
Vipassana is a technique which helps you to make an analytical study of the process of mind-matter interaction which is taking place constantly within you. It is not an intellectual game. You have to understand this interaction of mind and matter at the experiential level. How mind keeps on influencing the matter, how the matter keeps on influencing the mind. A constant interaction is going on. As you go deeper, you find constant currents, cross currents, undercurrents. One remains totally ignorant of what is happening deep inside. And one becomes a prisoner of the habit pattern, a blind habit pattern of reactions, which makes one so miserable, so unhappy. One keeps on generating defilements in the mind, negativities in the mind, makes oneself miserable, unhappy, and keeps on making others miserable, unhappy. The whole process can be easily understood at the intellectual level by these discourses or by reading books, but it does not help much. <coughs> One has to experience it. And this is what Vipassana does. It makes one experience the truth of one's own mind-matter phenomenon. the reality about oneself. All the sages and saints of the past have said, know thyself. And here, here is a process, a technique, which helps you to know yourself. One has to know oneself, not just for the sake of curiosity, not just to quench the thirst of inquisitiveness. One has to know oneself to come out of the ignorance. The ignorance which makes us so miserable, so unhappy. One does not know what one is doing deep inside. From the time one has taken birth, opened eyes, started seeing things outside, 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 the whole life, when the main extra world, extra world. One does not know what is happening inside. And unless one starts investigating the truth within oneself, one cannot find the real cause of one's misery. The apparent cause is very clear, something undesirable, something unwanted happens in the life, or something desirable, wanted, does not happen in the life, and one becomes miserable. Desirable or undesirable happening outside, one always remains under the same impression that the cause of my misery lies outside, outside. And therefore, all the energy, all the strength, one keeps on using to rectify things outside. A mother-in-law, you ask her why you are unhappy, why there is no peace and harmony in your household. Oh, this son-in-law, mad chef, he's good otherwise, but if he changes little bit, if he understands what I want to say, changes little bit, our house will be like a heaven. And you talk with the son-in-law, 
And he says, this old lady, <laughs> she doesn't understand the world has changed. There's a generation gap now. And she wants us to live in the way as she lived one generation ago. That's all. If she understands, if she corrects herself a little, the world will be wonderful. The husband will say, my wife should change a little. The wife says, my husband should change a little. The father wants the son to get changed a little. The son wants the father to get changed a little. Everyone else should change. Why I should change? I am perfectly all right. Nothing wrong with me. The whole life passes like this. We try to rectify others. We try to correct others. Because we find the cause of our misery in others. Because so and so is behaving like this. So and so has said, said me something like this. Or did something like this which I don't like. That's why I am miserable. If this person does not behave in this wrong way, does not speak such wrong language, if he does not work in a way that hurts me, I'm, I'll be very happy. Well, at the apparent level it is true, but this is not the truth at the deeper level, at the ultimate level. And because one does not know what is the real cause at the ultimate level, at the deeper level, all the energy goes waste. You try so hard to correct A or B or C. Not easy. You can't change others. Even if you are successful to change A or B or C, there is a guarantee that another D will not raise its head, or E will not raise its head, or Z will not raise its head. You can't change the entire world to your liking. Impossible. Someone becomes the sole ruler, the dictator of the whole world. Yet, not possible that things will happen exactly according to his or her wishes. Impossible. Then how to live peacefully? We can't rectify things outside according to our wishes, our desires, our dreams. Then how to live peacefully and harmoniously? Enlightened persons of the past found out a way. The saints and sages of the past found out a way and that is why they said, Know thyself, something wrong in you. Find out what is wrong in you. Find out what is this which you say, I, 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 my, 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 this physical structure. Is this I? Is this mine? Examine it. Is it really I? Is it really mine? And the mental structure, which you keep on saying, I, I, Mind, mind, examine it. See. See if it is really I. See if it is really mine. And if there is something beyond mind and matter, examine it, experience it, witness it, and see if it is really I, mine. Don't accept something because a tradition says so. Don't help it. Don't accept something because the majority of the people say so. Don't help you. Don't accept something because your scripture says so. Don't help you. Don't accept something because your teacher, your guru says so. Don't help you. Experience yourself. Understand the reality not merely at the intellectual level. Accept the reality not merely at the emotional or devotional level but understand and accept it at the actual level, the experiential level, then there will be no illusion, no delusion, no confusion, no hallucination. Things will become so clear to you because you have a direct experience of the reality and you will always start experiencing the reality at a very gross level. And you keep on observing it, observing it, just observing it objectively, without identifying yourself with it, the reality as it manifests itself from moment to moment, from moment to moment, you will notice that your capability to 
observe subtler realities become stronger and stronger. You start with very gross apparent reality. As you keep on working with it, you move towards subtler, subtler, subtler. You reach the subtlest reality pertaining to this material structure. You explore the entire field of matter within the framework of your body. You explore the entire field of the mental structure, starting from very gross reality, moving deeper, 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 reaching the subtlest reality pertaining to the mind. Starting with the grossest reality of the mental contents, and moving deeper, 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 you explore the entire field of mental contents, the subtlest reality pertaining to mental contents, then it becomes very easy for you to transcend. You transcend the entire field of mind and matter and you experience something which cannot be described in words. It is beyond mind and matter, the ultimate truth. Once you experience that, even for a few seconds or a few minutes, you are a totally changed person, totally changed person. The whole process of exploring the truth pertaining to yourself, the truth pertaining to mind and matter, the interaction of the two, will make you understand the law, the universal law, law of nature which is the universal truth. And when you start understanding this universal law at the experiential level, you will notice that this no law is so universal. The law of nature does not want you to defile your mind. As soon as you defile your mind, as soon as you generate any impurity in the mind, anger or hatred or ill will or animosity or passion or fear or ego or jealousy, anything, the nature starts punishing you. It starts punishing you then and there. Not that you are generating anger now and you will get some very unwholesome result after death. Yes, after death you will get unwholesome result, but leave it aside. What happens now is more important for what happens now? The experience of what happens now will give us the real wisdom, the understanding of the law. Vipassana helps you to go inside and see the interaction of mind and matter. How you have started generating negativity in your mind. Something unwanted has happened outside. This is apparent truth at the external level. But something has started happening inside, which has made you very miserable. And that something inside is your own negativity. You started generating negativity. As and when one generates negativity, one is bound to become miserable. We lose all the peace, all the harmony. Negativity and peace cannot coexist, cannot coexist. Like light and darkness cannot coexist. As soon as you generate negativity, you lose your peace, you lose your harmony, you become very miserable. When that particular negativity goes away, you are free from it, you find again there is peace, there is harmony. The mind wants to remain in peace and harmony, but because of ignorance, it keeps on generating negativity which takes away all the peace, all the harmony, one becomes miserable. When one is free from these negativities by any process, and Vipassana is one process which makes the mind free from all negativities, all impurities, not just at the surface level of the mind, but at the deepest level of the mind, the so-called unconscious mind, the root level of the mind, that gets purified, you don't have even a trace of negativity, the pure mind. The characteristic of the pure mind is that it 
always dwell in infinite love, infinite love, and that is pure love. Pure love does not have a trace of passion, it is full of compassion. Pure love does not expect anything in return, it is just giving, one may touch it, you just give, just give, without expecting anything. That pure love is the characteristic of a pure mind. Infinite compassion, infinite sympathetic joy, infinite equanimity. These are the four basic characteristics of a pure mind. When one acquires that state, there is no negativity. Mind is full of love, compassion, goodwill towards others. The nature starts rewarding you. Nature wants that to happen. Or you say, you can say the God Almighty wants that to happen. When you generate negativity, you defile your mind, nature does not like it. Or you say the God Almighty does not like it. When you purify your mind, fill it with good qualities of love, compassion, goodwill, the nature likes it. Or say the God Almighty likes it and starts rewarding you. By the practice of Vipassana, that means by the practice of observing the truth within yourself, one starts understanding this. Look, when I am free from these negativities and my mind is pure, full of love, compassion, goodwill, look how much peace. <clears throat> I experience so much of peace. I experience so much of harmony within. This is the reward. The nature has started giving you. And this law of nature, punishing you when you generate negativity in the mind, rewarding you when you purify your mind and generate good qualities in it. This law is universal. It does not belong to one particular religion, one particular sect, one particular community, one particular country. Nothing to it. It is universal. One may keep oneself calling as a Hindu or a Christian or a Buddhist or a Jewish. Makes no difference. Anyone who will generate anger or hatred or ill will or animosity is bound to suffer. The nature does not discriminate. The nature does not favor. And similarly, anyone who purifies the mind and develops good quality in the mind is bound to experience peace and harmony. One may call oneself by any name. It makes no difference at all. The law is universal. The law of nature is universal. Vipassana helps us to understand this law of nature, not just at the intellectual level, not by these discourses or sermons and discussions and debates or by reading scriptures or books, nothing to it. That will only purify your intellect to some extent. But deep inside, the habit pattern of the so-called unconscious mind will remain the same. It will keep on generating some negativity or the other, some impurity or the other, day and night, every moment. When you go deep inside, you will find Every moment, the mind at the deepest level, at the root level, every moment it is generating some negativity or the other. You don't realize it. Because the mind at the conscious level, you keep it busy with this sensual pleasure or that sensual pleasure. You don't know what's happening deep inside. Vipassana helps you to go to the root of your problem and to rectify the roots of your defiled mind. How does it work? <coughs> to start practicing Vipassana, you have to observe your own respiration. Natural breath. As it comes in, as it goes out, as it comes in, as it goes out. You have to join a camp, a center which has very congenial atmosphere 
congealed in the sense that there are least external disturbances and you can train your mind to observe the reality inside. The whole life the mind had been seeing things outside, outside or even thinking things outside, outside, never cared to observe or understand what is happening inside. So to change the direction of your mind, to observe the reality inside, it requires proper atmosphere. If you keep on giving the mind such objects which are external objects, mind will keep on running to those objects and won't work. Therefore, one has to join a camp for a period of 10 days, stay there, day and night. There are people to look after you. There is somebody to guide you. And the only work that you have to do is just observe the reality of the moment. And the reality which manifests itself from moment to moment, from moment to moment. Reality within yourself. Reality pertaining to yourself. Reality pertaining to your own physical structure and mental structure, interaction of the two. You are asked to sit down quietly, comfortably, any posture that suits you, that keeps you comfortable for longer periods, is a good posture for you. You have to keep your eyes closed. You have to keep your mouth closed. And just start observing the respiration. Just feel the respiration, the breath coming in. Keep your attention at the entrance of the nostrils and just feel the breath coming in, going out, coming in, going out. No breathing exercise. You are not supposed to control your breath. You are not supposed to regulate your breath. This is no pranayama. It has nothing to do with pranayam. Pranayam has its own advantage. Controlling the breath has its own advantage. It gives good physical health. That is different. But here, you are developing the faculty of your mind to observe the reality as it is. Not as you would like it to be, but as it is, naturally. The breath coming in, naturally. The breath going out, naturally. If it is deep, you don't try to make it shallow. Just accept, it is deep. If it is shallow, you don't try to make it deep. It is shallow. The reality as it is, the natural reality pertaining to yourself. You start it with breath. The breath passing through the left nostril as it is. Right nostril as it is. Or passing through both the nostrils as it is. Never try to interfere with the natural flow of the respiration. Just observe. The exercise is to observe the reality as it is. Things are happening. You do nothing. You have to do nothing. Like you are sitting at the bank of the river and the bank river is flowing. You do nothing for the flow of the river. It is naturally flowing. And you are just observing. Can there be any other easier thing to do. The easiest thing, you are doing nothing. You are just sitting, the, the river is flowing. The flow of respiration is there. You, you, you have your mind here, just observing, doing nothing. So easy, so easy. And yet so hard. So hard. Whenever you make up your mind and spare ten days of your life and you start practicing this, you will notice, so difficult. You hardly observed one or two breaths and the mind is gone. You don't know where. Gone. Only after 5, 10, 15 or 20 minutes you realize, oh, what happened? I was here to observe my mind, not my breath. Again you start. Again one or two breaths is gone somewhere, starts rolling in this part or that part. After some time one starts generating irritation. What sort of mind I am carrying? Such an easy job I have given to this mind to observe the natural breath and yet it cannot do, it keeps on wandering here, wandering there. And your Vipassana guide will say, oh no, don't react. Just accept the reality as it is. You have been reacting the whole life to things that you don't like. You are wanted, things have not happened. You want your mind to get concentrated, 
it is not getting concentrated and you are reacting with irritation. No, don't do that. Just accept the reality. At this moment, my mind has wandered away. Just accept it. No reaction. And you will find the mind will come back. You won't have to pull it back. It will just come back again and start working with respiration. Again it wanders away. And you realize it has wandered away. Smilingly you accept. Well, look, again it has wandered away. It will come back. Very patiently, patiently and persistently one keeps on working, keeps on working with the reality. A very cross reality. The breath coming in, going out, coming in, going out. In about three days' time, one starts experiencing subtler reality. There are sensations on the body. Every particle of the body, wherever there is light, there is some sensation or the other, some feeling or the other. Maybe heat, maybe perspiration, maybe cold, maybe throbbing, pulsing, vibrating, tingling, heaviness, numbness, some sensation or the other. Some biochemical reaction, some electromagnetic reaction <laughs> is taking place every moment throughout the physical structure. Mind is so gross, it can't feel things happening. Now with the practice of two, three, four days, the mind calms down and as the mind calms down, remaining with the reality. If the mind calms down, remaining with the imagination, remaining with any kind of verbalization or visualization or imagination, then not possible. Because you are with the reality, the truth, and every step on the path is to remain with the truth, the truth of this moment as it is. The truth of this moment as it is. This will take you to the subtler layers of the truth. You start feeling some sensation or the other here, and by the time the fourth day or the fifth day, you feel sensations throughout the body. From head to feet, from feet to head, everywhere. Initially, you come across very gross, solidified, intensified sensations like pain, like pressure, like heaviness, like heat, etc. This is how you start. But you train yourself to observe these realities, very gross, intensified, solidified sensations, objectively. Don't hear. And just see whether they are eternal. A pain has a, return, has a reason. Let us see how long it lasts. And you find sooner or later it passes away. A tension has a reason. Sooner or later it passes away. Any sensation that you feel, sooner or later it passes away. It arises to pass away. It arises to pass away. Oh, this is the law of nature. The entire physical structure keeps on changing constantly. Constantly, constantly, something is happening there, arising, passing, arising, passing. You just witness it, you do nothing. Of course, it is again very easy to say you just witness, you do nothing. The old habit pattern was to react, and you will find again caught in that old habit pattern. Many a times you find you are reacting. An unpleasant sensation has arisen and you don't like it, you want to get rid of it. You generate aversion towards it, you generate hatred towards it. And after some time you may feel a very pleasant sensation, a flow of very subtle vibrations. And you like it so much, then you react with craving, with clinging. That is the old habit pattern of the mind. And the Pashna will tell you, will, will ask you, will just observe, do nothing. A very unpleasant sensation you observe and you will find this is impermanent. A very pleasant sensation you observe and you find it possible. As you develop your faculty to observe the reality objectively without reacting. Quite a few students, by the time they reach on the seventh day or on the eighth day or ninth day or tenth day, they start experiencing the truth where all these solidified, intensified, gross sensations get dissolved. There is no solidity. The entire physical structure turns into a mass of vibrations, vibrations, very subtle vibrations, wavelets, wavelets, arising, passing, arising, passing, with great rapidity, high velocity, very high frequency, wavelets, 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 nothing but wavelets, wavelets. 
One may not reach this stage in one ten-day course, may reach in two ten-day course or three ten-day course. One has to reach this stage. In the language of India of those days, it was called bhanga, dissolution. Total dissolution, there should not be any solidity anywhere. No imagination. This is the truth. The entire material world is nothing but wavelets, wavelets. Your modern scientist says so, and the enlightened person 25 centuries back said so, sapo, loko, pakampito, pakampito, it is mere vibration, mere vibration, nothing but vibration, combustion, vibration, combustion, vibration. This is what is happening throughout the material universe. But if you just accept it because the scientist says so, or you just accept it because an enlightened person said so, it doesn't work, it doesn't help you. When you experience, and the Vipassana helps you to experience the entire material structure, just wavelets, wavelets, wavelets. And so also the entire mental structure, just wavelets, wavelets. Initially you come across very solidified, intense reality of the mind, say an anger as a reason, so intense. It overpowers you. Passion as a reason. Fear as a reason. Anxiety as a reason. They try to overpower you because they are so intense. You must observe. Your fear as a reason. Passion as a reason. Anger as a reason. Abstract anger as anger. Not the object of anger. Passion as passion. Fear as fear. Just observe. And you find that intensity starts getting divided, dissected, disintegrated, divided, dissected, disintegrated. Dissolve, dissolve, mere vibrations, nothing but vibrations. The entire physical structure is nothing but vibrations. The entire mental structure is nothing but vibration. You are moving towards the ultimate truth pertaining to mind and matter. At the surface level, at a very gross level, at the apparent level, yes, there is solidity. There is something very gross that you are speaking. But as you move deeper, deeper, the technique helps you to move deeper, deeper, without any effort, effortlessly. The nature starts helping you if you start observing the reality objectively. Deeper, 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 the entire mind-matter phenomenon is just wavelets, wavelets, vibrations, vibrations. You come to the eyes, vibration, vibration. Your attention comes to the ears, vibration, vibration. It comes to the nose. Vibration, vibration. It comes to the tongue, vibration, vibration. The body surface, the skin, vibration, vibration. And the mind, vibration, vibration. Understand these are the only six doors, six sense doors by which you come in contact with the outside world. There is no seventh door with you. The world is world for you only because it comes in contact with one or the other of the six sense doors. Somebody who is blind, birth blind. You keep on explaining this person, color is like this or light is like this. This person can never understand. For this person there is no world of color, no world of light. Someone is deaf from birth. Cannot understand what a sound is, what a word is. How will you try to explain? Cannot understand. The world is world only when it comes in contact with one sense door or the other. These six sense doors, they are all vibrations, vibrations. And as one develops on the path, one reaches the stage where one starts feeling the outside reality also. A world, a sound has come in contact with the ear and one will notice the sound is nothing but vibration, vibration. A shape, a form, a color, a light has come in contact with the eyes. It is nothing but vibration, vibration. A smell has come in contact with the nose. Vibration, vibration. A taste has come in contact with the tongue. Vibration, vibration. Something tangible has come in contact with the body. Vibration, vibration. A thought or emotion has come in contact with the mind. Vibration, vibration. Oh, the six sense doors are mere vibrations. The objects of six sense doors are mere vibrations. And one teaches the stage where this enlightened one announced Sabho Loko Pakampito Pakampito. The entire universe is mere vibrations, vibrations, nothing but vibrations. That has to be experienced. 
and what happens by this experience. You start understanding the whole process of the interaction of mind and matter, interaction of mind and matter, and you reach the stage where you find where your misery originates, how your misery starts, how it starts multiplying, how it starts overpowering you. And you also understand where you can root out the cause of your misery. It is for this purpose the whole exercise is done. It's not a rite or a ritual or a religious ceremony, nothing to it. It is a process of understanding the truth pertaining to yourself, the physical, the mental, within the framework of the body, and the entire sensorium within the framework of the body. A sound has come, or a shape has come, or a, or a smell has come. As soon as something happens at any sense door, you will notice, if one good Vipassana meditator, you will notice that one part of the mind has raised its head. Hey, something has happened. Ear sense door, or eye sense door, or nose sense door, or, or tongue sense door, or body sense door, or mind sense door. Something has happened. In the language of India of those days, it was called Vinyana. The nearest English translation of that is consciousness. Its job is to cognize. Look, something has happened. That's all. It can't do anything more than that. Immediately, another part of the mind will raise its head. In those days, it was called Sanya. The nearest English translation can be perception. And its job is to recognize. What sound? Hey, what sound? With all the memory of the past, with all the experience of the past, this second part of the mind, this sanya, it will recognize. Oh, these are words, words of abuse. Or these are words, words of praise. It has recognized. And it not merely recognizes, it also the evaluation. Words of abuse, very bad. Words of praise, ah, wonderful. Whether it was abuse or it was praise, they were mere vibrations. But how this part of the mind starts giving valuation, very good or very bad. At the first instant, when outside objects came in contact with your sense door, there were vibrations throughout the body, a new outside vibration came in contact with one sense door. Say a sound came in contact with the ear sense door. Like you strike a gong. And the gong starts vibrating strongly. So the sound has come in contact with the ear sense door. You strike the gong. The gong not merely vibrates at the particular spot where you struck it. The whole gong starts like vibrating. The sound has come in contact with the ear. And you find the entire body start vibrating in a particular way a neutral vibration throughout the body, a flow of neutral vibration. But when this second part of the mind, Sanya, has said, oh, these are the words of abuse. And if you are a developed, developed Vipassana practitioner, you will find immediately this flow of neutral vibration changes into very unpleasant vibration, very unpleasant vibration. And when this valuation is given, Oh, these words, these words are praise. Very good. And you find this neutral vibration turns into very pleasant vibration throughout the body. This is the third part of the mind which starts feeling vibrations. In the language of those days, it was called Vedana. You feel. You feel the vibrations, pleasant or unpleasant. And immediately the fourth part of the mind will start working. And that was called Sankhara in those days, Sanskara. Its job was to react. Its job is today. It reacts. Every moment it reacts. It reacts not to the outside object. At the apparent level it looks that one is reacting to the objects outside. You like something outside, you dislike something outside. When you like, you start craving and clinging. When you don't like, you start generating aversion or hatred. This was the enlightenment of the enlightened person that there is a missing link. You are not reacting to the outside object. With the outside object, the sensation has started. The vibration has started. And with the valuation being given, this vibration has turned, turned into pleasant or unpleasant. Then only you started craving or hating. Not before that. And unless you reach that stage, you are not going to the root of your problem. Now this step will take you to the root of your problem. 
problem because you are working with the very subtle vibrations on the body and you start understanding, look how this part of the mind constantly keeps on reacting to the body. What in the Western psychology you say a conscious mind or half conscious mind or unconscious mind. The Buddha, the enlightened one, didn't use these words because actually there is nothing unconscious. The very surface level of the mind, which is called conscious mind here, he used the word paritvachitra, that means a very small portion of the mind. This small portion of the mind keeps on rolling with things outside. But the major portion of the mind, up to the deepest level, is constantly in contact with the body sensation. Constant, day and night. And it keeps on reacting to these body sensations day and night. One is fast asleep. Who is fast asleep? The conscious mind is fast asleep. The so-called unconscious is not unconscious. It never sleeps. It is constantly in contact with the body sensations. You are fast asleep, a mosquito has come and bitten you. Your conscious mind does not know at all. The paritta chitta, the tiny mind, does not know at all. But what you call the unconscious immediately feels unpleasant sensation. It drives away the mosquito. Kills the mosquito. Still there is a sensation, so rubs the air, scratches the air. The whole night, how many times mosquitoes came and bit? Somebody asked you in the morning, how many times mosquitoes came and bit? One doesn't know at all. One doesn't know. Because the conscious mind is sleeping, it's unconscious, which is, which is experiencing and reacting, experiencing and reacting, whole night. And this keeps on happening day and night, whether you are awakened or you are asleep. There is a very thick barrier between the so-called conscious mind and the rest of the mind, which is the bigger mind. For example, if I am not a Vipassana meditator, what happens? I am sitting now, I am giving a talk. My conscious mind will keep on thinking, why I have said so much and now I have to come conclude. And uh, how I should conclude and what I should say, there is the job of my conscious mind. I will look at the face of the people. Are they taking interest in my talk? Are they understanding? Or are they getting bored? They are looking at their watches. They want to run away. Oh, I better stop. All that is the job of my conscious mind. But the so-called unconscious has nothing to do with all this. It is constantly feeling the sensations on the body. And sitting for a long time, this heavy weight body, some pressure starts there. <laughs> and it turns into a little pain. And the unconscious says, oh, I don't like it. I don't like it. And I make a little move like this. <laughs> and again, some pressure starts here. I make a move like this. I make a move like this, like this. Buddha said, you just observe somebody for 15 minutes, just keep on observing. And you will find this person keeps on doing like this, doing like this. Hey, what's happening? <laughs> this person does not know what is happening. Because the barrier between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. Unconscious keeps on reacting to this body sensation. If they are pleasant, it will get elated, wonderful. It will cling to it. If unpleasant, it will react, aversion, hatred, I don't like. This has become a blind habit pattern of the so-called root level of the mind, the unconscious level of the mind, unless that is corrected. Whatever rectification you do at the surface of the mind, it doesn't work. This person before becoming enlightened, he had tried so many different things, so many different ways which were popular in those days in India. They helped. They helped to calm the mind. They helped to purify the mind also. But to a certain level only. And then there was a barrier can't go deeper than that. The root level could not be changed. And he found out, discovered this technique of vipassana, observe deeper, deeper, deeper. You go to the root level. You are feeling a sensation. Every moment you are feeling a sensation, asleep or awakened. And this technique helps you. Every moment you feel it. You feel it. And instead of reacting, you understand its nature. And you find, look, it's changing. It's not eternal. It is ephemeral. It is impermanent. It arises to pass away, it arises to pass away. If you feel very gross, intensified, solidified sensation, it arises, seems to stay for some time, but sooner or later passes away. When you come to very subtle sensation, very subtle vibration, it arises, passes, arises, passes, great rapidity. Characteristic remains the same, changing, changing. A constant flux, a constant flow throughout the mind and matter structure. This reality is experienced to change the habit pattern of the mind, not to
to react with craving, not to react with aversion. These are the two roots to generate all the other negativities, to generate all the other defilements of the mind. And if these root level impurities are eradicated, one starts experiencing purification of mind, purification of mind. The whole behavior pattern starts changing. Then the life starts changing. At a deep level, if you have this reacting mind, whole life is full of reaction, reaction. And whenever you react, it is full of negativity. And now the life starts changing, life of action, not reaction, action. Anything has happened outside. Immediately you will see what is happening inside. It requires quite practice, not that in 10 days you will become perfect, but you find a path, a way, a technique which will take you to that stage. Anything happens outside, immediately you feel a sensation in the body. For a few moments only. Not that for minutes because you keep on observing. Otherwise, how will you deal with the situation? Few moments and you find your mind is calm, not reacting. Then whatever decision you make will be a good decision. Whatever action you take will be a good action, will be positive action because you are not reacting. Mind is very calm, equanimous and therefore always positive, positive, positive. This is how the whole technique changes the behavior pattern of the mind. Behavior, the habit pattern of the mind a mind full of reaction turns into full of action, positive action, full of love, full of compassion, full of goodwill for everyone. That is why say, we say Vipassana is an art of living. Art of living not merely for the people who call themselves Buddhists, not merely for the people who call themselves Hindus or Christians or Jains or, or Muslims. There is no difference. Human being is human being. Whenever one is reacting with negativity, one becomes so miserable. And one distributes this misery to others, makes others miserable. And whenever one comes out of this mad habit of reaction, one lives a life of positive action, full of love, compassion, goodwill. One starts enjoying peace and harmony within and starts distributing peace and harmony to others. This is what we call art of living, a way of life, a good way of life. How to live peacefully and harmoniously within and how to generate nothing but peace and harmony for others. It requires practice. There is no magic. There is no miracle. One has to work. One has to spare 10 days of the life to learn the technique. Then it's a lifetime job. Then every day you see how you apply this in your daily life. Every day you see how you apply this in your daily life. But first, initially, you have to learn how to go deep inside and observe the reality at the deepest level. Without any imagination, without any verbalization, without any visualization, the truth that you experience from moment to moment, moment to moment, pertaining to your own physical structure and mental structure, nothing but these two. You all have come and spared one hour to listen what Vipassana is and how it works. I hope and wish that you will spare ten days of your life to learn how to practice Vipassana and enjoy the fruits of Vipassana in your life. May all of you find time to learn this technique. May all of you find time to apply this technique in your daily life and enjoy peace, enjoy harmony. May all of you enjoy real peace, real harmony, real happiness, real happiness. anyone has any questions for Mr. Goenka that you would like to ask about uh, about the Pashka, we would be very pleased to, to receive those questions. Yes, sir. I'd like to ask about the true nature of being. The question is, what is the true nature of being? This is what you have to experience. Mere words cannot explain and you can't understand. Going deep inside is to understand what is this being, which I call I, or you, or he, or she, what it is. And this technique will help you to make an analytical study of the truth at the experiential level.
Thank you for coming this afternoon, and I wanted to again remind you that there is a, a center near Dallas, a Southwest Vipassana Meditation Center, at which regular courses in Vipassana are given. There is one course each month, and they are regularly scheduled. You'll find a schedule out in the vestibule, along with some literature and materials that will tell you a little bit more about it. There's no charge for the courses. They're given freely. We would invite each of you, uh, if it's of interest to you, to please uh, pick up an application form and, and uh, a schedule, and we would be just delighted to see you. Thank you very much.